Oh God, that is our anthem. When we think about who we are, when we think about who you are, we can only say that it is amazing that your grace would come to us. Thank you. I feel this morning acutely aware of my weakness, and I fear that the powerful words that are in your word that we'll look at this morning might be obscured by mine. We pray, O oh God, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see your truth, your power, and your wisdom in the gospel of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. This morning's installment of our Philosophy of Ministry series is called Embrace the Foolishness. You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 1. We'll be looking at verses 18 to 31. A philosophy of ministry can be thought of something like the great trunk and branches of a large tree. And the foliage and the leaves sort of define the shape of the tree for us from a distance. In a church, we might think of those leaves like the, the programs, the activities, what kind of songs we sing, how a worship service is structured, how people are cared for, how leadership is populated and structured and regulated. The various programs and activities of the church are like the leaves on that great tree, but underneath and behind the leaves, what really gives the tree its shape is that great and mighty trunk and those strong branches on which the leaves hang. A philosophy of ministry is like that trunk and those branches, and, and all of it, like a great tree rooted in soil, all of the philosophy of ministry is to be rooted in the rich soil of God's Word. And so this series is designed to help you see kind of behind the leaves, behind the foliage, to what makes Grace Bible Church what it is. Why do we do what we do? How many of these are left? Uh, probably seven. And these are the foundational convictions of what we do as a church. This morning's installment is embrace the foolishness. The gospel will never be a popular message outside of the people who have been saved by the gospel. And if we are to be faithful as a church, we must learn to embrace the foolishness of the message we proclaim. Let's read together 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to the end of the chapter. God writes through the Apostle Paul, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, 
who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The main idea of this text is found in verse 18. The word of the cross is foolishness to the perishing and the power of God to those being saved. The word of the cross, that is, the proclamation of Jesus the Messiah dying on a cross for sin, is simultaneously foolishness and power. It's foolishness to the perishing. That is, those who are presently, in an ongoing fashion, on their way to destruction. And yet it is the power of God for those being saved. Now, our familiarity with the cross has removed from us the shock of what a cross is. For the last 1,700 years or so, a cross has been an architectural feature on a building a tattoo on an arm as of late, or an ornament on an earlobe, jewelry dangling from a necklace. Now, we're not shocked at the sight of a cross. Our sensibilities are not offended by crosses. We have, in fact, become comfortable with crosses. This was not the case in the first century. A cross was an instrument for execution, a brutal mode of execution so horrific and so dishonorable that the very topic of crucifixion was considered unsuitable for civilized conversation. It's difficult to think of a present-day analogy to the offense of the cross in the first century. We might think back to the 17th century when European slave traders captured men, women, and children to sell them as property in the New World. Innocent persons were kidnapped, shackled, beaten, and crammed like sardines into the bellies of westbound sailing ships. Many of them suffered brutality, malnutrition, sickness, and death before ever reaching western shores. Their broken bodies dumped into the Atlantic like spoiled cargo. And the ones that survived the unimaginable journey found themselves far removed from their homes, treated as disposable property and less than human. Now imagine taking a symbol of the Atlantic slave trade, iron shackles perhaps, or a whip, or a slave ship, and wearing that symbol around as the mark of your identity, your glory, or the subject of your most joyful songs. And for this country, wearing some emblem of slavery would be a shock, a horror, a cause for shame, People would not say, oh, cool tattoo. They might scurry to the other side of the street or worse. If you somehow could represent Auschwitz, the Nazi death camp from World War II, and put it on a gold chain and wear it on your neck. Or maybe if you were in Japan in the 1940s and and you wore little Hiroshima bombs as earrings. Such symbols should shock the senses. The cross, shocking and shameful, would have been offensive to the sensibilities of first century people like the slave trade or Nazi death camps are to us. The cross was a form of execution so painful and so humiliating that it was not legal to crucify a Roman citizen, no matter how awful his crimes It was reserved for slaves and conquered enemies and the worst of criminals. The one being crucified was stripped naked and tied or nailed to wooden beams and left up in the air to suffer excruciating pain until finally, too weak to support his own weight, he would asphyxiate, unable to expand his lungs for one more breath. Crucifixions were public, designed to punish, to humiliate, and to create fear for all under the boot of the Roman Empire. It is likely that most first century residents of the Roman world had witnessed crucifixions. You would have been traumatized to have seen one of these torture executions, and you could not have forgotten it. 
the wretched sights and agonizing sounds of a man dying on a Roman cross would forever be emblazoned in your memory. To claim that your hope and your salvation and your joy are located in a person who was so shamefully executed would be to subject yourself to the scorn and ridicule of the world. Everyone knew that a crucifixion victim was a nobody, worse than a nobody, a humiliated lowlife villain worthy of no one's respect. And so the cross of Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, was polarizing. For most, the cross was proof that Jesus was a fraud and a nobody, worthy of ridicule. And anybody that follows such humiliation is likewise worthy of ridicule. But for others, the cross of Christ was life and peace and joy and heaven and access to God and everything dear. The cross became the emblem of everything the Christian loved. And this polarizing response is what Paul puts to us in 1 Corinthians 1.18. The proclamation of a crucified Messiah is foolishness to the perishing. But to us, the ones being saved, it is the power of God. Two weeks ago, we talked about the gospel being a watershed, a dividing line between humanity that extends to all eternity. And here we see that dividing line again. All of humanity is placed in one of only two camps, the perishing for whom the cross is foolishness and those being saved for whom the cross is the power of God. And the difference between these two camps, only faith. God-given faith. God-given trust in the cross, as we will see as this chapter unfolds. The church at Corinth was a beloved mess. The entire letter of 1 Corinthians is a massive corrective to the errors and flaws of a church in a city in the first century. They were marked by divisions and quarrels and factions as seen in verses 10 to 13 in chapter 1. And these are evidence that the Christians in Corinth were enamored with appearances and power and self-promotion and influence. They were impressed by the things of this world rather than by the power of God to save sinners seen in the cross of Christ. They were in need a reminder of a humiliated Savior, of the personal humility that comes with belonging to Jesus. They were in need of simply trusting God's counterintuitive and countercultural wisdom and power. Paul tells us, leading up to verse 18, that he didn't baptize very, very many people in Corinth. The people in Corinth were already saying, oh, I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos. Paul says, I, I didn't baptize anybody except for the house of Stephanus and Christus and maybe a few others. And Jesus didn't send me to you, Corinthians, to baptize you, but to preach the gospel. And what Paul feared is that the Corinthian believers would attach their faith to a name, they were enamored by prominent orators, speech writers, and thinkers that were celebrities in their day, and that they would attach importance to, to the name that they were attached to. So Paul actually thanks God that he didn't baptize very many of them, so they couldn't say, oh, yeah, Paul baptized me. And he says in verse 17, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And notice what he says about preaching the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech, literally not in high-sounding wisdom, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void, it would not be made empty, would not be nullified. Like, like the warranty on a piece of electronics is nullified when you throw it in the lake. <laughs> The cross becomes nullified and empty and powerless if people embrace the gospel because of a smooth-sounding speech or a persuasive orator or some other trick of the trade to get people to agree to Jesus. Jesus. 
Verse 17 serves as a heading for the rest of chapter 1 and for chapter 2. This message, Embrace the Foolishness, we'll do in two parts this morning's, is Embrace the Foolish Message. And in three weeks, we'll come back to this, and we will embrace a foolish method or methodology. Preach the gospel, not in words of wisdom, lest the cross become empty. The danger is that the cross will be emptied of its power if we change the message to suit the preferences of the perishing. And the cross is in danger of losing its power if we change our methodology to comply with the demands of those headed to destruction. Two weeks ago, we looked at the critical importance of the church maintaining its gospel proclamation. But the church will actually deny the gospel, forfeit the gospel, forsake the gospel if it tampers with the message or if it compromises the method of proclaiming the gospel. We must recognize that the perishing will despise our message. They'll scoff, they'll mock, they will ridicule, and yet it is the only message that can rescue the perishing. And so we embrace the foolishness of the gospel because it alone is the power of God to save those who believe. By means of organizing 1 Corinthians 18 to 31 this morning, we're going to look at five realities that display the foolishness and the power of the gospel message. Five realities that display simultaneously the foolishness and the power of the gospel message. First reality is this, God's plan Verses 19 to 21. Paul says, it is written. And he begins with a a promise of God and then a challenge from God or a dare from God. And then the fulfillment of that promise. This first reality we discover about the foolishness and power of the gospel is that it is the plan of God for his message to be a foolish message And this is his plan to actually demolish human wisdom, to level the proud, and to save those who believe. The plan is revealed in verse 19, a challenge is given in verse 20, and the accomplishment is detailed in verse 21. And when Paul talks about wisdom here, we often think of wisdom like the Proverbs deals with wisdom, a definition something like appropriate application of truth to life's circumstances. That's not how Paul is using wisdom here. Every context needs to define how wisdom is being uh, described. For here, when Paul is describing the wisdom of men, it is a pejorative term. It is a negative term. It's not a good thing. It is, in fact, the proud, self-styled thoughts of man in his rebellion against God. In the big scheme of things, it's actually not wise but it is the self-stated wisdom of man. Notice verse 19. Paul here is quoting from Isaiah chapter 29 when he says, It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And if we were to drop back into the context of Isaiah, in Isaiah 29, the, the people of Israel are being threatened by those who are opposed to God and to his people. And yet God wants to highlight some woes. Woes against surrounding nations and woes against the leadership of Israel. This is in that section of woes in Isaiah. And God says in verse 13 of Isaiah 29, Because this people, Israel, draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists in tradition learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning will be hidden. Woe to those who deeply hide their plans from the Lord, whose deeds are done in darkness, and they say, who sees us, who knows us? You turn things around. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? That what is made would say to its maker, he did not make me. Or that what is formed say to him, he has no understanding. What is God doing in Isaiah 29, 13 to 16? His intent is to humble the lip service hypocrites who think they are wise. Whose self-styled wisdom has elevated them in their own minds to be equal with God himself. 
And Paul's quote here is identical with Isaiah's statements, except for the last word. Isaiah says that God would hide their wisdom, hide their understanding. Paul changes the last word and says that God will set it aside, or a good translation of it is to frustrate their understanding. And I believe Paul has borrowed the last word from Psalm 33.10, where it says that God nullifies the counsel and frustrates the plans of the peoples. And God has taken the language of Isaiah and the language of Psalm 33 to make this point. God is intentionally confounding the wisdom and understanding of those who are confident in their own reasoning. The smarty pants of the world. God has made a plan to level them. And he does that through the gospel. This theme of man's wisdom versus God's wisdom is a theme that's prevalent through Scripture If I turned us to a short list in Proverbs, God very graciously reminds us not to trust ourselves, right? Disney says, trust your heart, follow your heart. God says, don't do that. (laughs) Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, (laughs) Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to Disney. I mean, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Proverbs 21, 2, every man's way is right in his own, way, in his own eyes, but Yahweh knows the heart. Proverbs 26, 12, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. In Proverbs 28, 26, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. God's assessment of human wisdom is not very kind. This is God's agenda with fallen man, an appeal to trust him rather than trust self. The humbling of the self-confident by salvation. And if they will not turn in humility, abandoning self to trust in God, then God will humble them by judgment. He will expose the wisdom of the world and crush the proud thoughts of man. Why is Paul addressing these things to the Corinthian believers? Because they were attracted to what the perishing world valued. Because they wanted esteem from the perishing. They were consumed with the admiration of human wisdom that God set out to destroy. Notice God's challenge in verse 20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And all of these are rhetorical questions designed for no answer. No scribe, no wise man, no debater can answer this charge. This could be an echo of Isaiah 33, 18, where the enemies of God and his people had surrounded the camp of Israel, and God made charges against the rulers, against the leaders, the administrators of Sennacherib's army. But here Paul uses this language to address the wise men of his day that the Corinthian believers were attracted to. The philosophers of Greek culture, the Stoics, the Epicureans, the Sophists, these were lovers of so-called wisdom. They were the thinkers and orators that the Corinthian believers were so enamored with. They entertained the crowds with rhetorical flourish and high-sounding words. And their elite status was reinforced by the loyalties of their fans. These were philosophers who had fan clubs. They were impressive in form, but they possessed no true wisdom. This is why Paul in verse 17 says, I will not preach the gospel with their high-sounding flourish. I don't want you to think that I'm impressing you the way they're trying to impress you. You will not be one to the gospel that way. You might be one to a fine speech, but not to Christ. And so Paul ran away from those things. Where is the wise man in comparison? Where is the scribe, God says? The scribes were the Jews who were experts in the scriptures. And like Paul before his own conversion, 
they knew a lot about the Bible, but they did not know God. And where is the debater of this age, the, the disputant, the professional skeptic, so celebrated for their ability to argue philosophy in a public debate? You know, they're the philosophy 101 professor at ASU who deconstructs everything else out there and asks a lot of questions but has absolutely no answers. And God dares them to answer this charge. The plan that God promised in verse 19 is seen to be unfolding in verse 21. Notice what he says there, since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. This is the plan of God, that that man would never come to know God by his own wisdom. And and why is man never going to get God through his own ingenuity, through his own thinking, his own philosophy? Because any God arrived at by human reasoning will only ever be a God of our own making. After our own image, according to our likeness, a projection of me into the heavens. God's plan is actually to prevent fallen man from coming to know him by his own wisdom. And it's not simply that the wisdom of this world did not come to know God, but the wisdom of this world could not come to know God. This was God's plan. God made it so. Notice what Paul says about him in verse 21. God was well pleased Consider that phrase. What are the kinds of things that please God? I'll give you just a brief survey. God was well pleased with his son, the Lord Jesus. God was pleased to give the kingdom to the little flock that followed his son in Luke 12. God was pleased, Colossians 1, to have all the fullness dwell in Jesus in bodily form. God was pleased in Ephesians 1.5 to predestine elect people for adoption as sons. And in Ephesians 1.9, God was well pleased to make known the mystery of his will to us in the church. And God is pleased to redeem us from the folly of our own wisdom. And here in verse 21, God is pleased also to reject and confound and frustrate the wisdom of men. To dismantle it and expose it. D.A. Carson said this, the message of the cross is nothing other than God's way of doing what he said he would do. By the cross, God sets aside and shatters all human pretensions to strength and wisdom. The second reality this morning that displays the foolishness and power of the gospel, in addition to the plan of God, is the demand of man. We see man's demand in verse 22. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. Now here you think, well, here's some seekers, here's some searchers, here's some people out there hunting for truth. I mean, what's so bad about looking for wisdom, and and what's so bad about looking for signs uh, that identify God and His work? You need to understand there are two kinds of a request like this. There's a request for a sign or or a request for wisdom that says, I need God. And then there's the kind that says, I evaluate God. And that second is what Paul is talking about here. Throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus, uh, the, the Jews around him said, what sign will you do to prove that you're the son of God? After he just fed 5,000 people. I mean, it's crazy their demand for a sign. They were always putting Jesus to the test. They were always evaluating God. They had God in the dock. God was in the defensive. And they were the prosecuting attorney. Man was the judge. And the Greeks, longing for wisdom, it was a a penchant for a system of philosophy that could consistently explain everything. And the evaluative nature of the Greek search for wisdom is this. God must meet my standard, my worldview, my philosophy, my system. God must live up to my definition of good. He must live up to what my definition of a God should be like. They would echo things like, well, my God would never do dot, dot, dot. 
The whole point there is they treat God as if they had the right to approve him. What an audacity. A third reality this morning demonstrates both the foolishness and the power of the gospel message. And it is our message seen in verses 23 and 24. Notice what Paul says. But we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. There is the polarizing nature of our message all over again. The different response in different audiences. This is a strong contrast in verse 23. The word but makes a a strong difference between what people are asking for and what Paul gives them. Jews demand a sign, prove to me that you're God. Greeks demand wisdom, prove to me that your philosophy of Jesus makes sense. And we do not give them what they ask for. We actually preach Messiah on a cross. And we're not embarrassed. Actually, we boldly, loudly, persistently, unashamedly proclaim a crucified Messiah. And think about what that sounds like. As one commentator said, this would be akin to proclaiming as good news that the victor has been vanquished, the market has collapsed, or that vacation has been canceled. What kind of a good news is a crucified Messiah? To the Jew expecting a victorious, conquering new David who would rule the world, crucified Messiah sounded like the worst kind of disappointment. And the followers of a crucified Messiah as the worst of fools and blasphemers. But that is exactly what we proclaim. The expected son of David came to the earth and was humiliated in death like the scum of humanity. And listen, there's a temptation for us. It's a stumbling block for the Jews. Well, I don't want them to trip. Let's take away the stumbling block. Uh, can we take away the offense? Can, can we wrap up this otherwise offensive message in, in some garb? Can we give it some inoffensive presentation? To the Jew expecting Messiah to be a king in glory, this was blasphemous. Deuteronomy 21.23 tells us that anyone who is hanged on a tree is cursed by God. And the New Testament actually affirms this. Galatians 3.13 quotes Deuteronomy 21 and says, yes, Jesus was hanged on a tree and therefore cursed by God. And this Messiah being cursed by God is your only hope for forgiveness of sin. To the Jew, it's a scandal. We get our English word scandal from the Greek word right here, scandal. It trips them up. It's a stumbling block. This theme about a a cornerstone, the the chief stone of God's building, which is Jesus Christ, that actually becomes the stumbling block for the builders. They can't get past the main thing that God would take on flesh and take on sin and die. For the Gentiles, for the whole Gentile world, world, with its various perspectives, a crucified God was foolish and weak. The Hellenized world, the the Greek world, was in love with philosophy and with wisdom. The Roman world was a a mighty, ironclad army, and they were in love with strength and power. And the Greeks hated the idea of being considered fools. The Romans hated the idea of being considered weak. And here you have king of the world, crucified, moronic, And puny. And so it's an offense to the whole Gentile world. For the Greeks, the crucified God did not live up to the acceptable standards of a refined philosophical worldview. And to the Romans, a crucified God was weak. He didn't live up to the Roman standards of strength and power. A crucified Messiah, a crucified God was the most repugnant contradiction imaginable. And so the religious leaders sneered as Jesus hung Come down off the cross and then we'll believe. He saved others. He can't save himself. He said he would tear down and rebuild the temple. Ha! The soldiers mocked. 
They dressed him up as a king, spit on him, beat him, pretended to worship. What will it be like for them when they meet Jesus again? Even the ones crucified with him mocked him. And that mockery didn't end in the first century. Justin Martyr in the second century was sharing the gospel with a Jewish rabbi from Daniel chapter 7, demonstrating that Jesus was in fact the son of man portrayed in that chapter. And the rabbi Trypho responded to Justin Martyr saying this, Sir, These and such like passages of Scripture compel us to await one who is great and glorious, and he takes the everlasting kingdom from the ancient of days as son of man. But this, your so-called Christ, is without honor and glory, so that he has even fallen into the uttermost curse that is in the law of God, for he was crucified. You hear the contempt in that for Jesus. In the third century, a a Christian named Origen is quoting a skeptic named Celsus, and he's answering Celsus's rejection of the gospel. And here's what Celsus says about Christ and about the invitation for people to believe. The skeptic says, their injunctions are like this. Let no one educated, no one wise, no one sensible draw near to this Jesus, for These abilities are thought by us to be evils. But as for anyone ignorant, anyone stupid, anyone uneducated, anyone who is a child, let them come boldly. By the fact that Christians themselves admit that these people are worthy of their God, they show that they want and are able to convince only the foolish, the dishonorable, and the stupid, only slaves, women, and little children. Contempt for the foolishness the cross. There's a sketch, a piece of Roman graffiti that has been found. And the artist depicts a worshiper standing before a crucified figure with the head of a donkey on the body of a man. And written next to the drawing says, Alex worships his God. Utter contempt. Today, there is still contempt for our message, contempt for the cross of a crucified Messiah as our only hope for forgiveness of sin. It comes in many forms. Your message doesn't meet my needs as I define them. Your message offends my self-esteem. I can make my way to heaven on my own. I don't need that kind of a, a crucifixion. I don't need a bloody cross in my place. I'm good enough. For some, the cross offends modern sensibilities. Early 20th century liberalism got rid of a bloody atonement. Blood sacrifice is not the way we talk about religion in the modern era. The cross offends people's sense of tolerance and pluralism. The only way to heaven is through a bloody cross and a crucified Messiah. It's offensive. But I think fundamentally the cross offends our assessment of our own abilities. The cross of Christ will always be a scandal. It will always be an offense to the self-righteous, the self-sufficient notions of fallen humankind. We're scandalized because we cannot contribute anything to our attainment of heaven, says the cross. And every religion of man is like the Tower of Babel. By his own efforts, man is building his tower of human achievements in a vain attempt to reach the heavens. And God, God actually has to come way down here to see this tower and to smash it. To be told that nothing you could ever do could merit heaven. That in fact, everything you've accomplished has only contributed to your condemnation. This offends the natural man. It offends the perishing. In our rebellion and arrogance, we think we know better than God what God should require of us. But God, when he stoops low to see our lofty little tower of human achievement, not only brings judgment, he also brings grace. For he rescues some of us from the haughty heights of our rebellious reasoning, humbling us to simply accept his terms by faith. And his terms are these, abandon self self 
in exchange for trust in the bloody, scandalous cross of his son. And the gospel is an assault on the glory of man. When a burdened sinner is ready for it by God's grace, the gospel is the most beautiful reality in all the world, worth losing everything in the world to get. To an unbeliever, wisdom and power are the last words one would use to describe the cross of Christ. But to a believer, wisdom and power are the first words we use to describe the cross of Christ. And here is the great news in verse 24. To those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, anybody, anywhere, it doesn't matter the sin, it doesn't matter the nationality, it doesn't matter the background, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. To the called. <laughs> what a great word that is. God does the work. The result of God's call is faith, so that the one who believes moves out of the category of the perishing and into the category of the rescued. Moved out of a disposition of antagonism towards the cross into a new disposition, embracing the cross, boasting in the cross, proclaiming the cross. There's a fourth reality in this passage that displays the foolishness and the power of the cross, and it is the vindication. Seen in verses 25 to 30. This is where the great reversal takes place, where what is truly wise, what is truly powerful, is seen to be what it always was, and what was thought to be wise and strong is exposed. Paul begins in verse 25 by saying, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. By the way, this is not a difference of degree. These are polar opposites. <laughs> the reason is given in verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren. And Paul turns the spotlight on the Corinthians themselves. Just think about you. And we could do that here this morning. Think about us gathered in this room. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble. I'm reading a biography of George Whitfield, and one of the people that came to faith under George Whitfield's preaching of the gospel, this is in the 1750s or so, was a noble woman in England, a countess or something like that. And she said, I was saved by an M. Notice that Paul doesn't say, not any noble. He says, not many noble. It's not that the, the important people, the beautiful people, the, the smart people cannot be humbled by the gospel and brought in. They are. But God is doing something to shame the wise, to, to shame the, the self-assured to bring about this great reversal, to expose the wisdom of the world as the folly that it always was and the strength of the world as the weakness that it always was by bringing to himself the nobodies. Look what he says in verse 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. And here's a summary statement. The things that are not. So that he may nullify or bring to nothing the things that are. What a remarkable reversal. The reason for all of this is given in verse 29, so that no man may boast before God. We'll come back to that in a moment. Notice verse 30. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Listen, this is vindication of the foolishness and the power of the gospel message. Foolishness in that it is despised by those who are perishing, but power in that people actually get saved. The gospel accomplishes something that the might and wisdom of the world could never touch. Reconciliation to God, eternal life, victory over the grave. 
not all the strength, not all the wisdom, not all the wealth, not all the beauty, not all the importance, not all the influence, not all the power of all of the world of all eras can help a man when he meets his maker. Can extend a life past a handful of decades. But the gospel does this. And Corinthian believers, he's done this in you. By his doing, you are, and here's this great New Testament phrase, full of theology in Christ. You are in him. And notice what Paul describes about being in Christ. Christ Jesus became to us wisdom from God. And I think that wisdom from God is the summary of everything else that follows. We probably should read it this way. He became to us wisdom from God, even righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This righteousness is a judicial statement. It is God reckoning us as righteousness. Sanctification is a positional statement. God setting us apart for himself. And redemption is a situational statement. It is rescue. This is a word that comes from rescue out of the slave market. All of these things are ours in Christ. By the wisdom and power of the gospel. The final reality that displays the foolishness and power of the gospel is found in verse 31, and it is resulting glory, resulting glory. Here in verse 31, we have the the great and final result, so that just as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This was the stated purpose in verse 29, here it comes to its reality in verse 31, and Paul is picking up a quotation from Jeremiah 9. And there Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. And let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness and justice and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. This is the great no boasting clause of your Bible. Not allowed to boast, not allowed to brag, except in this one thing, that you get to know Yahweh personally, relationally, and it's good. God demolishes human boasting, and he does it for the believer by reminding us once again of the humiliation that brings about our redemption And our humility that goes along with that. For the unbeliever, God will demolish human boasting by lining up all of the perishing in front of him at a great white throne and consigning them to eternal condemnation. And all of their smarts and all of their muscles got them nothing when it mattered most. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 are foundational chapters for how we are to think about the gospel, about evangelism with our neighbors, about the ministry of the local church. Martin Lloyd-Jones said in 1945, I'm convinced that no chapters are more important to preach at this time than 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. More recently, D.A. Carson has said, the message of these sections from 1 Corinthians must be learned afresh by every generation of Christians or else the gospel will be sidelined by assorted fads. It's true. We need to know these two chapters of our Bible. We need to cling to these two chapters. We need to embrace the foolishness of the gospel message. Some implications for us briefly. We have to stop trying to impress the world. In our personal evangelism, in our ministry as a local church, God never uses what the world is impressed by to save people. God actually sets out to crush what the world is impressed by. Celebrity status, worldly smarts, power, influence, these are not the tools to advance the gospel. And I know we think wrongly about this. We think, oh, if so-and-so celebrity or sports star or influential person would just embrace the gospel and then proclaim it, then people would believe. That's not how God works. 
Never mind the flyers you get in your mailboxes from churches in our neighborhood that say otherwise. God is out to shame and expose celebrity status and power and influence that the world esteems. These are the very things the gospel must crush. And to use them as some sort of tool or bargaining chip to make the gospel palatable actually undermines the gospel. And that's a sermon for three weeks from now. We have to resist the temptation to believe that being impressive to the world will win a hearing. Secondly, we do not submit our message to the world for approval. As we'll see in a few weeks in 1 Corinthians 2, we do not package our message to try to mitigate the offense. Otherwise, we end up with a bait and switch. I need to trick you to think that my message is something else, maybe some self-help tip, and then I'm going to sneak in the gospel message and try to do it in a way that's not offensive. You can't take the offense away from the cross of Christ. It's inherent in the message by God's design. That we don't alter the message to accommodate the world. A third implication for us is we must not just be content to look foolish, but actually embrace it. Actually embrace it. The physician who knows he has the cure to a patient's mortal need isn't going to care if, if the patient thinks he's silly. He, he's not going to change the remedy to accommodate the patient's attitude. He knows what the patient needs. And in love and compassion and duty, he gives the right remedy. What the world considers foolish and weak, we know it is the infinite wisdom and power of God. And so we proclaim it boldly with a smile and with joy, knowing it's exactly how we got saved. A fourth implication is we must embrace personal humility. Unashamedly embracing the humiliation of Jesus the Christ ought to produce a personal humility in all of us. This was probably the primary application that Paul had in mind for the Corinthian believers. To assault their own pride by reminding them what the cross is. And then a last thought for us this morning. We boast in nothing. We boast in nothing. Except the great, inestimable, high, infinite privilege of knowing God. We have only one hope, one song, one boast. And we sing this. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Jesus, these are the very words we want to sing now. Would you be pleased to make these our boast, our song, our proclamation without failing or flagging until you return for your glory and let us who boast boast in you.